Uh, this time we invite you to join us for a time of quiet prayer and meditation as we prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord who created the heavens and the earth. Amen. We welcome you to our worship service, and we invite you, if you're a guest, to fill out one of the cards that uh, should be in the pew in front of you and drop that in the offering plate that we might have a record of your visit. It is good to have you with us. The bulletin has been redesigned just a little bit. You might notice that. Some of you might not. Um, the announcements are now in the middle. And the visitor's section, we now have a visitor's packet. So please make sure the visitors get a packet so they can know the information they need. Uh, one, a couple of things I want to point out. Um, bon Clarkin retreat, our congregational retreat at Bon Clarkin, which will be September the 30th, October 1st and 2nd. Uh, that's coming up. That has been one of our uh, just wonderful times in the life of our church where we go up to Bon Clarkin. It's a beautiful time of the year. Uh, we have some time just to hang out among friends or with your family. And then we come together and we do some things as a congregation. It's been a, a great time to get to know people, and I encourage you to go. The other thing that I want to point out is the communicants class. Uh, we don't do a lot of these. Uh, a lot of times we just take people one-on-one. -on -one. But we do have several children who have expressed an interest, children and youth who expressed an interest in joining the church. So if you're interested, if your family, if you have a child in your family that is interested, please let us know so that we can get them to be a part of that um, process. Uh, Jordan has a couple of announcements. Good morning. A um, couple announcements. Today is Mission Sunday. As you notice inside of your bulletin, there is an envelope um, to support the missions fund. I encourage everyone to donate to that to support the mission and missionaries that are overseas. And also... Um, <clears throat> Youth, um, the senior highs are going to Bon Clarkin at, on the 23rd to 25th of September. The forms are out in the hallway down the bulletin board right outside the fellowship hall. Please pick up those, and I need to know if your youth is going by September 7th so I can get the numbers in. If I find out after that, the cost is going to go up $20. So originally it will be 40 but then if, after that it will become 20 So please let me know as soon as you can. Thank you. We come with a heavy heart this morning. For many of us, um, uh, most of you have heard Rich Kelso passed away this week. Rich was uh, been at this church for over 40 years, um, and he passed away while hiking in Canada. Um, and that puts a little bit of a, a hurt probably for us to be here a little bit this morning as we miss our friend and we, we mourn for his family. But having said that, we know that Rich loved the Lord. We know that Rich is in heaven. And as we sing and as we worship, we're entering into that eternal worship where Rich is now before the throne of God. With that in mind, let's prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. I'm gonna live so I can 
If you stand for the call to worship. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 29, verses 1 and 2. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Now let's all turn together in the Red Trinity Hymnal to number 457, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Number 457, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning in your house, worshiping your name. For we come and worship you, O Almighty God, the one who knows us, the one who has made us, and the one that loves us, the one who has no beginning and has no end, the one who is perfect and righteous, full of justice and mercy. And we come giving you our praise, Lord thanking you for the ability to know you, to know who you are and what you have done, and how great and awesome that you are. And Lord, we come this morning thanking you that you have given us this opportunity to know you through your grace. For we confess that we were cut off from you. We confess that we in our sinfulness and our transgressions upon you, against you and your law, that we were set apart from you and that we were lost. And we come thanking you and continuing to look to you as our Redeemer, as the one who, is, who came into this world, who came and died on a cross, who took the punishment for all of our sins and took them on his head so that we may be brought back to you, that we might be called children of God. And we pray this morning that as we face the temptations of this daily life, Lord, that we continue to look to you as our Savior and as the one that can redeem us and help us through the temptations of this world, one that would help us overcome them. And now, Lord, we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hear the words of pardon from the Holy Scriptures in Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. By Christ, God has created a new heart for his people and has cleansed us from all uncleanness. If you have confessed your sins with faith in Christ, then this promise is yours today and forever. It's the last Sunday of the month, so as we have been doing in the past, we will continue to do again. We'll be confessing our faith through the Nicene Creed. So Christians, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We come and we praise you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the opportunity now to worship you through the giving of our tithes and offerings. We bring them in worship to give honor to you and glory, to bring a, a heart of obedience to your word and a, no, a knowledge that as we bring our tithes together and use them together within the church, we can do great things. You can do great things through us. Father, bless us and use, us, use our tithes and offerings for your glory and the building up of your church. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated.
may be seated if you take your blue ARP Psalter. We'll be singing Psalm 13 this morning. Psalm 13, O Lord, be thou my helper true. Let, let us not leave ourselves and sleep in death with those who die. Let's hear the rest of that. See, I have overcome him now. My enemy will call. My adversaries will rejoice when I begin to fall. But your unfailing love I trust. Your saving power I praise. The Lord in bounty dealt with me. My song to him I raise. Amen from Psalm 13. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we come and we praise you that though we are hard pressed, though this world comes against us as we see in Psalm 13, yet we come to you and you are our strong tower, you are our mighty fortress, you are our rock that will not move. And Father, we come with thanksgiving. We thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the blessings that you have poured out upon us as a congregation. We thank you for the work that you're doing in the lives of individuals and families, of Sunday school classes, and the whole of our congregation. We see you at work, and we thank you for it. We come, and we sing our songs of praise. Because in bounty you have dealt with us. Father, we come and we lift up our prayers. We pray for suffering people. We pray, Father, for Italy. In the area of Italy affected by the earthquake. Father, we pray that your grace and peace, that your comfort, that your power would be poured out upon these people. We pray for the church in that area that they might... Uh, be able to respond and give witness to your love and your mercy in the times of trial. Father, we pray for Syria as it has been ravaged by civil war. We pray for those who are caught in this conflict. And we pray for peace. Father, we pray for Christians in Central Africa who have gone, undergone persecution at the hands of Muslims. Father, we pray that you would be with our brothers and sisters there, that they would stand firm in the face of persecution, that they would not deny Christ, and that they would be faithful even to death. Father, we pray that you would give them boldness and that you would be with them and you would cause them to prosper. Father, we pray for churches that exist underground, Many of our countries in this world, the church is not allowed to be out in public. And so we pray for the safety of these Christians that meet in the face of peril. We pray that even as there's danger, we pray for boldness. Father, we come and we pray for our own nation. We pray for the upcoming presidential election. We pray, Father, for revival in our churches. We pray that you would fan 
the embers to flame and that we would see revival in our churches, revival that would flow into our communities and into our nation. Father, we pray for peace in our nation and for freedom. Father, we pray for South Carolina. We pray for our churches. We pray that you would bless the churches of our state, help us to work together to reach out to the lost, to stand for the poor, for the hurting, for the disadvantaged. And Father, help us to stand for your glory and your truth in all aspects. Father, we pray for our government, our state government. We pray for our governor. We pray for our legislature. We pray for all forms of our government. And may you bless us, and we thank you for it. And We pray that it would continue to be a blessing. Father, we pray for Lancaster. We pray for economic growth. We pray that you would bring industry in, that you would bring all sorts of jobs so that people who want to work can work and make a fair wage and live. We pray for the unity of our community, that though we are made up of very, very different segments of a community, we pray that we would have unity. And we pray for the spiritual growth of this town and this county, that you would be at work not only in our church, but in all the churches, that you would be at work in the people of Lancaster to draw them closer and closer to Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for our church. Father, we pray that we would reach out for those on the fringe of our congregation. Help us to reach out to them. Help them to know how much we love them. Help us to warmly welcome them back. And Father, we pray that you would help us to reach out first to our own and then to continue to reach out into the community, into all aspects of our community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that this work that you are doing in each of us we pray that you would continue this work. And we pray that you would be with the leadership of our congregation. We pray that you would bless this, the elders and the deacons. We pray that you would bless the membership and all those associated with our congregation. Father, we come to you and give praise to you. Father, we come and we pray for our sister churches. We pray for the Edwards Memorial Church in Casey, South Carolina. We pray for their pastor, Greg Slater. Pray for the Effingham Presbyterian Church in uh, Effingham near Florence. We pray, Father, for their pastor, Brian Howard. Father, be with these men, be with their congregation, bless them, and let them be lights of the gospel in their area. Father, we pray for ourselves. Father, we pray for those who are sick. Some have viruses. We have reports of especially some of the school-aged children being sick and having to go to the doctor even this morning. We pray, Father, for their healing and that they would quickly recover their health. We pray for protection for the other children. We pray, Father, for those who are dealing with illness, who are suffering physically. Father, we pray that you would just bring healing. We pray for those who are struggling emotionally and mentally. We pray that you would pour out your grace and peace, make your face and your countenance shine upon them that they might know your grace and your love and they be strengthened by your presence. Father, we come, and we as a congregation grieve the loss of a, of a good friend, of a teacher. Father, we pray you pour out your grace upon us this morning. Pray out your comfort and your strength. Father, we pray for Rich's family. We pray for Grace and Rebecca, for Anita and Christina. Father, we pray that you would make yourself very real to them. Uh, give them comfort as they remember the life that Rich lived before them with Christ. But Father, we pray your grace, peace, and love be poured out upon them through your Son. And Father, we pray that you would be with Richard Crawford and his family, as his dad is very low as well. We pray your grace and peace upon them. Father, we come this morning, and we come and we are thankful that you are you're there, and you're always there. And though this world be turned upside down, though the mountains be thrown into the sea, you are there, and you do not move. 
Your eye never blinks. You are constant in watching over us, your people. And we come and give praise to you this morning because it is true. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. While, while Kristen's coming and the choir is about to sing, one thing that I do want to announce, and I meant to do it earlier, and I apologize. That after the service, I know many of you have places to go and to be, but we're going to have a time of prayer. If you would come down to the front here, we're going to pray for Rich's family, and we're also going to pray for the Crawford family. So if you have time, just a few minutes, if you'll meet down here, we'll have a short time of prayer following, the, um, following worship service. Thank you.
It's time the children, the younger children, come down for the children's sermon with Mr. Jordan. Okay. How are y'all this morning? Good. So, I got a problem. Allergies are starting to come around. I'm sneezing, I'm coughing and stuff. So, what should I do? Is medicine, okay. What will that medicine do? We stop sneezing and coughing and all that and help it go away? Right. And that's what medicine normally does, right? So say if you know, you're sick, you go to the doctor and they, they prescribe you medicine. You go home and you take the medicine and it helps you get better, right? And it works on a lot of different things. Now, is can I go to the doctor and get medicine to help get rid of sin? You sure? They, they have a lot of different kind of medicines. Would it work for that? Why? Okay, you can't, only God can help you with that? And how can God help us with that? What did, ask Him to forgive you, right? Now, we, ha, we all have sinful natures. That's something that we're born with, where we like to sin. And sin separates us from God. But how, how do we get rid of that, the sin problem overall? That's through Jesus. Jesus came and he died on the cross so that our sins, so that our sin problem, our sin sickness, just like the medicine gets rid of normal sickness, so that it would go away. Now, we still might sin day to day, on, might, might tell a lie, might do something we shouldn't, but we're supposed to, but we're forgiven because of it. So, Jesus is the remedy for our sin. So, I want you guys to think about that. If you're ever sick or anything, you're taking some medicine, think about how Jesus got rid of sin in your life. So, let's pray, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you provided a, a way for the, the sin in our lives be remedied. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his work on the cross, Lord. And I pray that you continue to work in us each and every day. I pray that you guide us and keep us in all that we do. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you turn within your Bibles to the book of Romans, Romans 11, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 10. After having the summer in the Psalms, we're coming back to our study in Romans. We hope to have it done by the end of the year. Um, Paul has been dealing with several subjects. Right now he's dealing with the issue of, of why, are the, why is Israel not saved? He's been dealing with that through 9 and 10, and he keeps, continues to look at that as we look at chapter 11. Let us pray before we go before the Lord, um, before his word. Great Father in heaven, we come to you, our creator and our redeemer, the one who has loved our souls, who has sent Christ, who has left us with light from your word, that we might see and know who you are and what you have done, that we might see who we are, that we might see our need, and that we might see your continuing love to us. Father, help us as we continue to look at a challenging book in the book of Romans, but an important one that we might see your character, that we might see your love, and that we might see you for who you are. Father, I pray that you would bless this time now, that we might be built up through your word, give your servant words to speak, and give your people hearts and ears to hear. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, for we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Romans 11, beginning with verse 1, let us hear God's word. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. 
God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture say, says of Elijah? How he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars. And I alone am left. And they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see, and ears that would not hear, down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. The grass withers, the flowers fade. But the word of our Lord endures forever. Amen. Probably many of us at some point or another have gotten, we were in a job and we got a new boss. Maybe you're a school teacher, you had a new principal, a new manager, um, someone in authority over you. And there's that awkward time of trying to figure out what is this person like. And there's those moments where they do things. Maybe they come in and they're heavy-handed. And you start thinking to yourself, I'm going to have to find another job. I can't work for this crazy man, this crazy woman, right? And, or, or maybe they take it another way. Maybe they come in and they're like, I wish they would take care of these problems. They're either hard or soft or in the middle. But you know what it does? It takes time, doesn't it, to figure out who this person is. Probably some of the people that you said, I can't work for this person, you wound up loving later when you saw how they led and how they acted. You saw their character. And there's probably some that you thought you were going to love. And after a while, you saw how they led and how they acted and you saw their character and you, and you wish you would have never stayed. I think what we see here in the book of Romans, at this point, is God's character being defended. Paul is dealing with the very character of God and who God is. And there is a great challenge that is being put forward, and Paul has been answering this question in chapters 9, 10, and now 11 about why is Israel, why is, are the Hebrews why are they not flocking to Jesus, who is the Messiah? Has God's promises failed? What is going on? Because if he failed Israel, how can we trust him? You see why it's important? As we go through this, we're going to see Paul logically defending God and saying, no, he is the God who he says he is. Not just in theory, but in practice, in practical application, even here when it comes to the salvation of Israel. God leaves a remnant. God saves his people. And he does it by grace. The first thing we see here is that God has not rejected his people. Verse 1. This is the question. This is the logical question as Paul is thinking through this and trying to make a logical argument. In, verse, in chapter 9, he dealt with God's sovereignty. He quotes the Old Testament and says, I will choose, I will save who I save. Esau I have loved, Jacob I have, excuse me. 
Jacob I have loved. Esau I have hated. Let's get that right. And God's sovereign, and he will choose to save who he chooses. In verse 10, he says, Israel is rejected not because God just, just chose not to do anything, but because of their own sinfulness. And so we come to chapter 11. And the logical question then is what he asks. Has God rejected his people? This by no means is emphatic. Absolutely not, says Paul. It is the strongest reaction he can have. He said, he's, and he basically here says, you want proof that God has not rejected Israel and the Jews? Look at me. Paul says, look at me. I myself am an Israelite, descendant of Abraham, member of the tribe of Benjamin. And that's pretty significant, right? Because not only does Paul here represent that God has not rejected his people, think about who he was before he was saved. Think about Saul of Tarsus. Think about what he was doing. He was the epitome of everything that was wrong in Israel. He exemplified it. He rejected Jesus. He rejected Christ as the Messiah. He was so adamant, he was persecuting the Christians, even going into foreign countries to wipe them off the face of the earth until he met Jesus, until his eyes were opened. Paul here is saying, God has not rejected Israel. I am Israel. I am Jewish. I receive grace. And he was saved. And he proclaims the gospel. He says that God has not rejected his people that he foreknew. In Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, he says that Paul writes to the Ephesians saying that from the foundation of the earth, God's people were chosen. And we see that clearly because since the beginning of, of man, when man fell in the garden, since Adam Man has deserved wrath and has deserved to have his heart hardened. Which is really just, God, is, he, God would have been righteous and just letting us go do our own thing. I, don't, I try not to eat fast food a lot, but I think it was Burger King that said, have it your way. Is that right? Nobody's going to say that because you're not going to admit to eating half fast food, right? Or watching television because it's a commercial. That's okay. But this is what God should have been able to say. It's just, have it your way. Just run off into your sin. But he doesn't do that. God has acted, acted in an active manner to save his people. And God has kept his promise to his people. Another proof that he gives here is he quotes the story from Kings of uh, Elijah. And Elijah, if you know the story, he's depressed here. Okay, he's just, I mean, he has had this mountaintop experience. He has had this wonderful situation where he has confronted the prophets of Baal, and he has defeated them, and the people have wiped them out, and the rain that he had prayed in, it hadn't rained for years, and now he prayed, and the rain has come, and he should have been ecstatic, but Jezebel says, I'm going to get you. And for some reason, that, that drove Elijah. And so not only does he flee from the power and the area of Jezebel's control, he keeps fleeing. And we see a man hard-pressed. We see this crying out. You know, we just had this great victory, but I'm the only one left. 
They killed everybody, and I'm the only one left. And God says, no, you're not. I have preserved 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Now, Elijah's not wrong. Israel was in a mess. Israel had turned from God. The majority of people had turned from God. David on Wednesday night, they're all going through the kings, I believe. Uh, is that right? Kings? And he showed me the chart. He's like, it's really amazing when you look at it how bad the kings really were. There's very few that were actually sort of faithful. Elijah is not wrong in seeing it, but what he was wrong in thinking he was all alone. That God had cut off the people completely except for him. No, there were 7,000 that had not bowed the knee to Baal. Well, Paul says, same thing today. Right? So too at the present time there's a remnant chosen by grace. This idea of remnant is important. That God will keep a remnant of his people. His promises is to his remnant. In the book of Obadiah, which is a book of judgments against Edom, the nation of Edom, it says there will be no survivors. In Isaiah 17, Syria, it says to cease to exist. But in Israel, we see the idea of remnant. And that's important. For here is where God keeps his promise. I have never read this book, but I've seen it, and I understand what it's about. There's a book called How the Irish Saved Western Civilization. Has anybody read that? Well, good. I'm glad y'all don't. Every time I ask you if you've seen a movie, nobody's ever seen any of the movies I've seen, so at least we're all in the same boat. I haven't read it. But the gist of this is it's true. There was a point during the, what we call the Dark Ages that the monasteries and the, the universities and places were, were savaged in the continent. But the monasteries in Ireland maintained much of the history and the culture written. And that was when we came into, uh, out of the Dark Ages, that was there for us. There was an idea that these monasteries in Ireland served as a remnant. Though the culture had been destroyed in, in, in the continent of Europe to, to a great degree, though there was a lot of backwardness in education and a loss of, of, of learned things, yet here God prepared and kept great knowledge. The question we have is, is God still doing this today? We're his people. We're the spiritual Israel. You and I are his people. Is God continuing to maintain a remnant even in the face of difficulty and in the face of a world that is threatening? If we were to watch the news or if we were to look at things on the internet we would think that we were about to be wiped off the face of the earth at times, wasn't it, as Christians. But yet, is there not a strong remnant? We are tempted to maybe ask the question, has God rejected blank? Blank. The blank is what you fill in. And I think it's different for each of us. Has God rejected America? Some of us would say, yes, he has. Some of us would say, no, he hasn't. Depends on what we mean. There's no doubt that we see widespread corruption. We see immorality. I don't think any of us would agree that our culture and society is moving in the direction we want to see it move in. But has God rejected us? The answer is no. Why is that? Because here's a remnant. Here we are. Here we sit. Here we sing. Here we go out of this place to proclaim. Here we are. And wherever God's people are, we see a remnant. And we see God at work. Has God rejected Muslims? Some of us might say, yes. They live in a dark place. There's nothing going on there spiritually. 
And to my shame, I, I think I've mentioned this last three Sundays in a row. Let me just make sure I get the point through. God is doing great things in these Muslim nations. Iran in 1979 had 300 Christians. And now they have 2 million. Isn't that amazing? God had kept a remnant. And now he's fanning that remnant, those embers to flame. Is, has God rejected the young? You young people, has God just rejected your generation? Because we don't see it looking like other generations? Not, not at all. You go to a college campus, even secular college campuses. We saw, we ate lunch or breakfast this week with the RUF minister, um, which is associated to the ARPs and the PCA and those groups, at Christens University at Winthrop. And they had their first meeting and a couple hundred were there, just in that ministry alone. God is working, and we see a remnant. Are there great issues? Are there great problems? Are there things that need to be addressed? Yes, but God has not abandoned his people. God has kept his promise, and God is working. And though sometimes that remnant grows small, yet it's there. And the spirit, how it can blow those remnants, those embers. Blow them till they glow and blow them till they burst into flame and how great a fire can come. And we see that through church history. Well, the second thing we see, the remnant, it comes from God's grace alone. So too at this present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Paul is saying that there is now a remnant today. But it's not because they're better than everybody else. It's not because they've tried harder than everybody else. Again, Paul is the example. And Paul stunk at it, right? Paul was going the wrong way. It took God jerking him literally off the road and opening his eyes. There was nothing that Paul did to save himself. It was God and God alone, and this is what he writes about. That the remnant, like Paul, was chosen by grace. Now, grace must be understood as completely unmerited. Completely. Totally. Because if you don't do it completely and totally unmerited, then it's no longer grace. No part of grace is because of work or merit or because you are owed something. By very definition, that's not grace. Now, we sometimes use grace that way, right? We'll give them a little grace. This is total grace. And this is how we, the remnant, come to be. Israel had sought salvation by the law through works, but this was a complete and total dead end. You are either saved 100% by the grace of God through the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel, or you are 100% dead. There is no option. There is no balance. It's one or the other. Being a good Scotsman and a Presbyterian, from time to time I will go to Craigslist and I will click on the free button. There's a category where people are giving away stuff for free. Again, if they're giving it away for free, we might need it, right? Don't tell Kelly this because she says we don't need anything whether it's free or not free. But anyway. But the other day there was a warning on the free section of Craigslist that said, free is not always free. And the person put on there and says, you need to be real careful. If they don't give you a phone number and they only want you to con connect to you through email, what they're doing often is taking your email and selling it. They're taking part of you and using it to do something else. So though you might get that 1979 stereo for free. 
they're taking your email. They're taking from you. You're putting into, some, into it, so it's really not free. God doesn't do that. Oh, yeah, we're supposed to work. We're supposed to follow him. We're supposed to be holy as God is holy. But none of that is in the equation that gets us to salvation. That is completely and totally in Jesus Christ. It's in his life, his death, and his resurrection. And it's all on him. When God looks at you, he doesn't see anything that you have done that is good for salvation. He sees you through Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, he, you have imputed to you all that you need. You couldn't add something to it. That's why Paul calls our works filthy rags. Not because our works aren't good in worldly terms. Not that we're not trying hard. But compared to the perfect work of Christ, they are filthy rags. We must trust God's free and amazing grace. We cannot add to it. And we should have confidence in God that our salvation is sure in Christ. And respond in love to his grace. Good works are a response to grace, not a cause of salvation, but the way we show our love and thanks. Third and final thing, there is a way to be saved. Excuse me, there is no way to be saved but by grace. The elect of Israel found it. Only the elect, only those that God went out of his way to fill with the Spirit, to open their eyes and their heart. And some people struggle with this. I struggle with this growing up. This idea of election and God saving. Look at Paul. Look at Paul. Here is a man who was not wrestling. He was not doing anything except persecuting the church. And here God's grace came and saved him. Here God's grace came and transformed him. Not because of any good, because there wasn't any good but because of God's free and gracious love. We see that what happens with Israel is that their very thing that they were so intense about, their zeal for the law, for the traditions, for the things of God that they could put their hands upon, worked against them. David here says, he quotes David, about how their tables sort of turned the table on. The tables that should have been feeding them became a snare and a trap. The, the block that should have lifted them up to God became a stumbling block. And the scriptures that should have opened their eyes darkened their eyes. God let them have it the way they wanted it. But the elect, he moves harder. He moves, for, I mean, he moves into their lives and through the Spirit he draws them to himself. And this is, his, this is his grace that Paul speaks of. This is why there's a remnant. If God doesn't do this, there is no remnant. If God doesn't move to save, if God doesn't bring Christ, if God doesn't fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit, if God doesn't come alongside of us when we go out and tell people about Jesus and work in their hearts and their minds, there is no remnant and all are lost. But God has worked. The problem with Israel is they were trying to do it the wrong way. We've seen that in verse chapter 9, chapter 10, and now chapter 11. Probably all of us have had this experience before, not paying attention, something on your mind, trying to walk into a, a store, and you can't get the door to open, right? And you go, and you push, and you push, and you're like, why won't the door open, you know? And, you, you know. and then you notice that it says pull, not push, right? And don't, don't. Don't act like you've never done that before. 
And usually there's somebody in there going, read the sign. <laughs> read the sign. Israel kept pushing. They kept pushing when they should have pulled. If God doesn't tell us to read the sign, if God doesn't open our eyes to see what is right before us, if what was right before Israel, then all are lost. And we come and we thank God that he had not rejected his people. He had not rejected his people in the days of Elijah. He had not rejected his people in the days of Paul. He has not rejected his people today whether they be Jew or Gentile. God is still working in his people. He is working in cultures around the world. He is working. But it's always and only by grace that this work takes place. Tradition, knowledge, works, these can be good things. But they must never infringe upon grace. For we are saved only through Christ and only because of what Christ has done for us. And we are a remnant. Pray that God would flame us, that he would fan us so that we flame and burn brightly and are useful. That God would work through us as he worked through the remnant in Israel, as he worked through the remnant in the early church, as he worked through the remnant in church history at different points. May this be the time that God works. You see, because the more we study God, the more you study church history, the more you read the Bible, the more his character comes into play. He has not rejected us. He has not turned his back on us but his remnant is here and he is working Dr. Kelly who just retired from RTS and we had him here a few years ago taught systematic theology he told my class of, of pastors that we might not ever see the benefit of what we do he foresaw a time that we're in now where we don't see great revival in the church, where we don't see great strides going forward in this nation. But he said, God has not given up on us. And very well, just he, he appeared it to the tide. That God, sort of his kingdom comes in like the tide comes in, one wave at a time. And as one wave comes in, it'll draw back a little bit. And then the next wave will go a little further and draw back. And... I think his point was that we are kind of in a point where maybe it's drawing back. But the next wave is coming. The remnant is here. God is working. His grace is working. And he will not abandon his people. And when he makes a promise to you, it is true. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, it's hard being a remnant. And we long for that day when you shall come back and the church will be whole and we will be with you. Father, we pray that you would help us to see your character. Help us to know that you have not abandoned your people. Help us to know that your people are still here because of your grace and always because of your grace. Father, help us to be a people of grace and help us to depend upon you knowing that you are a good and gracious God, seeing all that you've done through Jesus Christ and all that you have done throughout the history of the church and even what you are doing here among us now. Help us to see your grace and help us to live in this grace. For we pray it in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. If you take your red Trinity hymnal, we're going to sing as our hymn of response number 693 as we stand and sing Blessed Assurance 693 in the red Trinity hymnal.
Savior of sinners and believe upon him and have faith in him and trust in him, then you too can know the grace of God and be saved and be his child. A reminder that those who can stay for a few moments, we're going to meet over here and have prayer uh, as soon as we greet one another for a few moments um, and have prayer for both the Kelsos and the Crawford family. Let's receive the benediction of the Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen and amen.